Welcome to Financial Minds Meet the Experts. I'm Jamie Agostino, your host. On this show, we're joined by financial industry experts to talk about topics, trends, and themes that credit union professionals need to know about. We are continuing our series dedicated to Cybersecurity Month. Today on Financial Minds Meet the Experts, we are talking about recognize and report phishing. We are joined by John Cuneo, Information Director, and Keely Hartman, Information Security Analyst for Vizzo Financial. Thank you both for joining me today. Uh, Keely, this is your second time on the podcast. And John, you're a returning guest. So you've been with us a, a, a few times. So thank you both. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It. Yeah. So let's dive right in. So Keely, what is phishing? So uh, phishing is a form of social engineering that, believe it or not, many people are actually aware of, but they're not able to properly identify it. So phishing is a method that's used by bad actors or hackers that produce mainly a massive amount of fraudulent messages to users of a specific site or application. Um, These fraudulent messages will most likely contain a sensitive link that will take a user to a website that asks for their login information. Um, The bad messages and the sites the links will take you to usually tend to look 100% legit at first glance. Um, But once a user is prompted to enter their login information, the page will likely just reload as if your login failed or you never even attempted to log in. So from there on out, uh, the fisher, if you will, is able to access your account data and whatever personally identifiable information that may be stored on your account. All right. So I know there's there's a lot of different types of phishing. So what are these types of phishing that are out there? So um, <laughs> there's as many flavors of phishing that there is ice cream. So I'll try to explain um, the main forms of phishing that you may see and that people should be on the lookout for. Um, So I'll just go ahead first with straight phishing. I know I already talked about what it is, but I'll go into a little bit more depth. Uh, One of my lovely coworkers, Mike Bechtel, said that phishing is like a fisherman with a huge net just trying to scoop up whatever fish that she or he can get. Um, And regular phishing can be completely random and sent to just about anybody to see what unlucky people will fall for the bait and give up their information. So going into a little bit more specifically, we'll talk about spear phishing. So spear phishing is an attack that will be targeted towards certain individuals, organizations, or businesses. A typical example of spear phishing is the classic email and attachment. This could be from any site, whether it's a social media site, your banking website, or something as simple as your own HR department at work. The goal of these spear phishing attacks is to make it seem like the user is receiving an email from a trusted employee of their organization or a trusted automated email from a website that you use. Um, Once these emails are carefully tailored to each individual, The goal is for the user to gain enough trust to click on the attachment or go to the provided link. And once that's done, it only takes one more step of a user to enter certain personal information to give away much more information than they ever wanted. Um, So another type of phishing attack is smishing. And this type of phishing attack has become a lot more common. And if you don't know what smishing is, It's SMS or text phishing. And it's an attack that I actually receive a lot of the time. So smishing attacks can come from a variety of different senders. Like other phishing attacks, the goal of the sender is for the receiver to click on a bad link. Smishing texts will typically come from places like Amazon, FedEx or UPS, the IRS, or sometimes even weight loss programs. Um, They typically will all have an urgent message or offering something for free, which we all know is too good to be true. All right. So, you know, it it just seems like there's just so much uh, that's out there. Um, Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're inundated, you know, with so many things. So, John, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, what's the difference between phishing, because we get those emails, 
and then spam or are they the same? Um, there's some similarities. Um, they're both not wanted or they're unsolicited. They're not, you know, they both have a reason behind them. One's malicious. The other one's just wants you to buy something or purchase something or go somewhere to support it. Um, and you know, they both waste, waste your time because, you know, <laughs> you're, you're getting inundated with them. Spam, but spam is more, I, I would call them, I, I like the analogy of what we're going through right now because it's election season and we're in the midterm elections. And every time you go to your mailbox, you have a new mailer from <laughs> said, said candidate, right? Or you got a new mailer from the new business that's opening up or the your your cable company that wants you to switch over to them. That's spam. It's just coming to get your, your attention, to get you to try to go out to their website, to, to purchase their service, to get their vote um very unharmful it just basically wastes your time but most people don't want to deal with it and most of the time they come you throw them in the trash can right whereas phishing is more hey it's geared to social engineer it's geared to trick you uh in many different ways we call it uh fud fear uncertainty or doubt so they're trying to get one of those three things into you that you can react immediately and want to give up information so like Keely said they're looking for passwords they're looking for other type of personal or PII type of information um, that they can use now into a person you or to compromise your account um, so that's the main difference between the two one one is just like it's just mass and it's not really there's not many there's not much bad uh, reasoning behind it it's just to get you to 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 buy something or to or to support something and the other one it's bad it, they they want you to download malware they want to compromise your accounts they want to you know um get you to open up an attachment and then they can take that and and spread out more emails from that make it look like it's coming from you so those those are two main that's the main differences between the two all right um so then Keely, what are the signs of a phishing attempt how can i identify a phishing scheme? So the signs of a phishing attempt can be a little tricky to identify, but once you've identified a couple of bad fish, um, you'll be able to easily recognize any phish attempt on you. So one of the major signs of a phishing attempt is getting the user to click on a link or an attachment. If you receive any messages on social media, email, or text that ask you to go to a direct link, do not click it as it is most likely an attempt to steal your information. If you were really curious about this link that they sent you, you should try to you know, type in the domain name into your phone or your, your regular browsing address to see if it's actually legit or not. Um, so the second big sign of a phishing attempt, and one of the main ways to identify a phishing scam, is to carefully take a look at who sent you the message. Likely, it'll come from someone you know, or as I mentioned, a social media site, like their automated uh, senders. And a lot of these email platforms, you can turn on a setting that allow you to see the user's actual email address along with their set name. Um, so if you don't have this turned on, you'll just be able to see their name and it looks like someone that you're coming or someone that you know. Um, and so the biggest way is to reveal their true identity by, you know, hovering over their name to actually pop up their email address. And this can be a huge sign in identifying if you have previously had contact with the sender before or if they're actually who they say they might be. Um, a few other ways you can identify phishing scams is by looking at grammar, spelling, and anything that might mention the word free. Um, a lot of scammers will mistype grammar and spelling throughout their emails, proving that they're either A, not the automated sender, or B, they might be someone um, that doesn't have English as their first language, unfortunately. So that can be a huge giveaway. All right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we definitely see a lot of those uh, phishing <laughs> attempts all the time. Um, sometimes they do make them enticing. I mean, I was, I was <laughs> up for like $20 million. I really debated <laughs> clicking that, but I knew better. Uh, so then, John, you know, what are the risks of phishing attempts 
to credit unions? What are the risks associated with it? Yeah, so phishing is usually the the the, the vector or the method that an attacker uses to compromise a network. So when you click on, you can get that phishing and you get a click click on a link and they install, say, a banking Trojan, like uh, like uh, the old school Zeus or uh, SpyEye, or there's there's all kinds of banking Trojans out there. Now they can have insight into your network, uh, specifically that machine. They might be able to, you know, be able to leverage that to get across to other pieces or other assets in your network. Um, what we're seeing more and more common, though, is that they're using phishing to try to compromise your email system. So then they can use that to compromise or send out a whole bunch that look like they're coming from the credit union. They'll go to your membership. They could go to your fellow fellow credit union CEOs. If you and say if it's a CEO or a CFO, they can go out to you know your vendors. Um, so they're just trying to get someone to react, click on things, and then they can use uh, that email system uh, to send out more phishing emails but add some legitimacy to to that email that when it comes through. So if it's say I would be compromised, now all my emails will go out saying John Cunio with my email address. So what Keely was talking about earlier, they can spoof my name all they want, but if they, a lot of times we see a Gmail account or a, you know, a Verizon account or some type of ISB account in the back end. When you hit reply on, on a PC, it will show it or you hover over top of it, you should see it. It's a little more difficult with mobile phones, but same same concept but when they can compromise my email now it's john cuneo and it's john cuneo's email addresses so uh you know that's what they're trying to do with a lot of this and that's the harm that we see um but they can install key loggers they can install banking trojans they can install all this stuff onto the on the to devices and now they have insight into what the operations is and then at some point they can possibly take over uh, ransomware can come through this uh where we start locking out the, the 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 PCs and the assets and then demand a ransom. Um, that's that's becoming more and more common in other industries. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's hitting the financial sector. We just don't hear about it as much. But uh, hospitals are big with that. Uh, they're very. It's very common to see a, a ransomware coming, and when you see it, you find out that it's from from a hospital, um, especially a not for profit one. It's just because of limited budgets. But yeah, those are some of the risks that you can see with phishing at credit unions. You know, John, my follow up then is, you know, what should credit unions do to protect, you know, the staff in the credit union from these scams and schemes of the bad actors? Yeah. So, so that's a great question because you, you have to. And a credit union is in a position where they almost have to protect their membership, too, not just their, their staff. Right. Um, so education is is the biggest, biggest thing. Um, we I would say risk assessments, too, because you have to risk assess uh, what your your threats are, and then determine any controls that you can put around it, uh, and close those gaps as much as possible. But when you get to down to it, the the best way, the, the cheapest way is education. And you can do, um, you can go, go out and purchase uh, a subscription to, to give this to you. There's um, different websites. SANS has a uh, secure the um, human uh, type of podcast that are out there. Um, but you just education, security awareness training, showing them um, what phishing is, what threats are. Uh, you can also make sure that their accounts are have MFA on them, especially their cloud accounts. Uh, email is a great one because M365 is very, very popular. Uh, and and because of the way it works, the, the, be, the ability to expand and scale as needed. Um, so MFA those accounts, make sure there's there's a multi-factor. We I think we've had multi-factor on this podcast several times, so I won't go too deep into that. But make sure there's multi-factor attached to the the authentication process of the email account. Um, there's some software out there, but most of that looks for spam. Uh, it's very difficult to for the software to see phishing, um, but there is some software out there to try to filter some of that out. There's um, if you have Microsoft 365 or something similar to that, there's a lot of times there's attachment scanning, link scanning that can be done and they can quarantine those links. Um, so those, there's, those are different type of ways to protect. But I think the, the key one is awareness training, uh, not just for the staff, but also for memberships to let them know uh, <laughs> we will never send an email asking for this, or we will never send a text asking for this, or we will never send a text because some institution will <laughs> never send a text. So let them know this is how we will communicate with you that's very key for their membership and i think staff will understand um 
and be able to handle those calls when the membership says, oh, did we, I just got a text from you. Well, we never text like that. So it's also training them up on what is good common practices as well. All right. So, so Keely, you know, John's talking about, you know, a good, strong staff training program. So what should be included in a staff training program? So in a staff training program, um, you should be testing your employees periodically for phishing attempts. Here at Vizzo, we regularly test our employees with fake phishing emails to see who will or who won't fall for the fake bait. Um, upon those who initially do fall for the bait, you should continue to retest them until they meet sort of a passing rate of being able to properly identify phishing emails and not go into those links that um, we're sending out to test them. Um, another thing that should be included in your staff training program is to update the attempts of real phishing emails that your organization has actually seen. Um, you should take these emails and make them available for all staff to review, along with the pointed out red flags so that they know what to look for if a similar phishing email um, would come out and end up to happen in their inbox. Uh, so the last very important thing you should do, and this isn't just for the, the staff training program, you should regularly send out all staff emails when several of your employees have rep reported receiving the same phishing email. Um, being that more of a handful of your employees uh, have received and reported the same phishing email, it is really important that you send out a mass email to the rest of your staff uh, to warn them that, you know, hey, this email is coming into some of our employees' inboxes and we want to get it out there um, and warn you guys about it so that you don't fall for the bait and um, end up causing any damage to your organization. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Consistency. I mean, I, I look for those emails from, from this team, you know, at Vizzo Financial <laughs> and, you know, you guys do a great job as far as highlighting, like, you know, we just received this. Here are some of the red flags to show that it was, you know, a phishing attempt. You know, if you get this, you know, please delete or um, and things like that. So uh, great advice there. Um, so, John, you know, what if there's that chance that one employee, they click the link in a phishing attempt. What should the credit union now do? Oh, shut down. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah so. This is where incident response comes in. Like there has to be an incident response program of some kind with a playbook. This is what we do when this happens. Um, typically though, you would, you know, isolate that machine without shutting it down. So you can do some scanning on it. You want to do antivirus scanning. You want to do um, maybe some malware type of malware bytes type of scanning on top of your tip, traditional antivirus. Um, you want to understand the, the threat make sure you understand the threat by seeing the email. Um, maybe run that email if there's a link or an attachment through the antivirus to see if there's anything malicious inside it. Determine how far that clicking went. Um, sometimes it only went to a certain port. It goes to a, a site and the site's asking for information and that's as far as it went. And they never put the information in. So really that becomes kind of a mute point, but to be safe, you want to um, you want to still scan the machine to make sure, you know, just just to have your checks and balances in. Um, additionally, though, you know, you, this is where you have a process and a procedure in place so that maybe it doesn't even get to that point. They that you have a place that they can uh, forward that email to get confirmation if it's legit or not, um, and then you can have another set of eyes to say, okay, no, this doesn't look right, and then we don't we can cut off the clicking if we we build into our culture. Uh, a, a, a process in place, a process to, to to get a second pair of eyes on it, right? Someone that may be a little bit more versed in that field um, can take a look at it and say yes or no, right? So those are some of the things that you can have, but the, the key there is an incident response program. Have it outlined. This is what we're going to do if this would happen. These are the steps we're going to take. And then this is who we reported to. Um, this is, you know, what are each staff member's responsibilities through that process, and then we get it cleaned up as much as possible and get that machine back up and operational as quickly as possible. All right. Yeah. Sounds like procedures. I mean, you know, you really got to have that, that all detailed out and scenarios. Um, yes. So. 
I would add one more thing, mm-hmm. and then you should test that to, to, to get it down pat. It needs to become memory, uh, like muscle memory, you know, sort of goes with that security awareness training program that Keely just mentioned. There's also a, a, the training should include testing your incident response. So test what you would do if something got, gets clicked on or, or an attachment is open and, and, and how you would react to it so that when it does happen, you're ready and you're prepared. All right. Well, Keely, John, thank you so much for joining me today, you know, to talk about this. Um, Keely, any final thoughts for our listeners? Uh, I don't have any final thoughts. I just hope to be back on this podcast sometime soon. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. John, any <laughs> final thoughts? Sure. Yeah, I got one. If you don't know, <laughs> don't click. If you don't know, or you're you not go. sure, don't click. Because I mean, it was a big thing. I'm going to date myself early, late 2008, you know, 2010s. There was a big program of don't click, don't click in the cybersecurity world. So just don't click. If you don't, if you're not sure, don't click, close it out, delete it. If they really want you, they'll figure out a way to get back to get back in touch with you a second time. So. All right. Well, thank you both for joining me and, and for our listeners, you know, John did mention MFA. Actually, Keely was on just last week to talk about MFA along with Mike Bechtel. So you can go back and watch that episode if you haven't to learn more about MFA. And then next week, John's coming back along with Mike um, for next week's podcast dedicated to Cybersecurity Month. So thank you both so much. And with that, thanks for listening and have a great day. 